Welcome to this, the fifth programme in our series exploring aspects of Ireland's railways over the last 50 years or more. In this video, we are delighted to be able to present some of the earliest and most fascinating footage we have uncovered to date, which has enabled us to travel back in time to the 1940s and 50s. We begin our programme at Straban, the hub of the County Donegal Norrigate system, from which three-foot gauge lines radiated to Letterkenny, Stranorler, and at the time our films were made, also to Londonderry. A pair of Great Northern Q-Class 440s bring a train from Belfast to Derry into Straban in July 1950. Shunting in the adjacent Norrigage station is 464 tank number 11, Ern. In this sequence we shall see all three surviving classes of CDR steam locomotives. Behind the 464 tank is one of the trio of Class 5A 264 tanks, the CDR's last steam locomotives delivered to the railway in 1912. Another Class 5A, number 2, Blanche, approaches Straban with a train on the Norgage branch from Derry, which closed in 1954. As the steam locomotive shunts the stock of the Derry train, the brand new rail car number 19, which had only just been delivered to the railway that year, passes by. The next arrival is a goods off the Letterkenny branch. The third type of Donegal steam locomotive is represented by Class 5 264 tank, number 6, Drumbo, built by Naismith Wilson in Manchester in 1907. Four six four tank Ern is shunting some of the lightweight red liveried vans which were specially designed to run with the rail cars which operated most CDR passenger services by this time. Mail for destinations in County Donegal is being transferred from the Great Northern van to Narragage wagons on the adjacent track under the supervision of the customs official wearing the white topped hat. We now leave Straban to see something of County Donegal's other Narragage system. By 1950, all that remained of the once extensive system operated in the north and northwest of County Donegal by the London Derry and Luxville Railway were the branches from Derry to Letterkenny and Bernkrana. The line beyond Letterkenny to Burtonport, which we covered in Volume 3 of this series, and that from Bernkrana to Carndana, had already closed by this time. This is Penny Burnham Derry, where the company had its works. 460 tank number three, built by Andrew Barclay in 1903 for the opening of the Burtonport line, is seen on shed. At Fawn, on the shores of Loch Swilly, north of Derry, we are awaiting the arrival of the goods from Derry to Brincrana, which conveyed a carriage at the rear for any passengers who were not in too much of a hurry to reach their destination. And here she comes, hauled by 462 tank number 10, built by Kerr Stewart in 1904 and originally named Richmond. The third wagon in the train is a CDR one. Despite operating in the same county, Luxwilly and Donegal wagons had draw gear of different heights and only a few specially modified CDR wagons could be conveyed in Luxwilly trains. The line from Londonderry to Brincrana was built as a broad gauge route, opening in 1864. It was converted to the three foot gauge in 1885 and extended with government money some 18 and a half miles north to Carndana in 1901. The extension lasted only 34 years, closing in 1935. Freight traffic on the branches to Letterkenny and Brincrana ceased in July 1953, three years after these scenes were recorded. However, the company continued to operate buses and lorries long after its rail services had ended, these vehicles proudly proclaiming that they were the property of the Londonderry and Luxwilly Railway Company. The third narrow gauge line in this sequence is one we have never before covered in this series. The Irish three-foot gauge had its origins in County Antrim in the 1870s. Eventually lines ran from Ballymena to Retreat and Larne. Whilst further north, an independent company built a three-foot gauge branch to link the seaside town of Ballycastle with Ballymoney on the broad gauge route from Belfast to Coleraine and Londonderry. Taken over by the London Midland and Scottish Railway in 1924, it was the last three-foot gauge line in County Antrim to remain open for passengers. 
Our films were shot at Ballymoney, the junction with the main line, on the day the branch closed, the 3rd of July, 1950. The narrow gauge line terminated in a bay alongside the up broad gauge platform. The local was one of the delightful series of 242 compound tanks built for the Antrim lines between 1892 and 1920. The connection for Belfast arrives hauled by W Class 26 Nought, number 99, King George VI, built for the LMS lines in Elster at York Road Works in Belfast in 1938. Trains on both gauges leave Ballymoney together, a scene that would never be repeated after this day. The scene now moves across Northern Ireland to Gora Wood on the Belfast to Dublin main line of the Great Northern Railway. A train from the Newry branch arrives at the station, hauled by 442 tank number 139. Great Northern V Class 440 number 87 Kestrel departs on an express for Dublin. The date is July 1947, and filmmaker C.J. Barnard has a footplate pass for the run from Gora Wood up to the summit of the line and over the border to Dundalk. The locomotive is S Class 440 number 190 Lugnaquilla. The train speeds over the Craigmore Viaduct near Bestbrook and passes a Down Express headed by a pair of 440s. The line climbs steadily from Gora Wood to its summit at milepost 65 and a half. Once that is passed, it is a downhill dash to Dundalk. Dundalk was at the heart of the Great Northern. The company had been formed in 1876 through the amalgamation of a number of smaller concerns. But it was here at Dundalk, where the GNR built its new locomotive works in the 1880s, that the pride and identity of Ireland's finest railway was forged. This rare footage made in the works dates from July 1947. The GNR solitary crane tank, number 31, built by Hawthorne Leslie in 1928, was usually to be found at the works. Here it shunts a wagon along the up main line. A knot six knot receives attention on the shear legs at the works. Whilst number 31 retires to the shed. In the sidings are GNR 062 tank number 168 and one of the locomotives of the Dundalk, Newry and Grenoble Railway, to which we will return later in the programme. Wagons of locomotive coal are unloaded as a UG class 060, one of five dating from 1937, which were the last new locomotives built at Dundalk, passes the GNR steam breakdown crane parked in a siding beside the main line. Back at the station, V-Class compound number 83 Eagle makes a spirited departure with an express for Dublin. The sublime compound is in stark contrast to the faintly ridiculous rail bus in the bay. There was a long GNR branch from Drogheda on the main line through Navan to Oldcastle. Part of this line is still open to carry ore from Tara Mines near Navan. In the 1950s, the branch was normally worked by one of the GNR's rail buses, which provided a very economical way of maintaining passenger services on a line such as this, which would not have had sufficient traffic to justify the costs involved in running a conventional steam train. Rail bus number one, seen here at Navan, forming a service to Oldcastle, was powered by a 62 horsepower Gardner diesel engine and ran on the Howden Meredith wheels, the invention of two GNR engineers which combined a steel flange and a rubber tyre. The entrance to the vehicle was via the platform at the rear, which was level with conventional railway station platforms. There were also steps down to rail level 
which enabled the rail bus to pick up passengers at level crossings and other convenient points along the way. Later on, on what turned out to be a very wet day in the summer of 1957, the rail bus was making the return trip from Mulcastle to Drogheda, and is seen here arriving back at Navan. One of the drawbacks with the rail buses was that they could only be driven from one end and had to be turned after each journey. Rail bus number one, which dated from 1934 and is now preserved at the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum, just outside Belfast, is on the turntable at Drogheda, being prepared for another trip back to Old Castle. This sequence featuring the rail bus was filmed by Tim Shuttleworth. At the south end of Drogheda station ten years earlier, in July 1947, V-Class compound number 86 Peregrine, with an uncharacteristic slip, gets a heavy Belfast to Dublin train underway. S-Class 440 number 170 Errigal arrives from the south. The compounds at this time were still the largest GNR 440s. The VS class 440s, one of which is seen here leaving the GNR station in Dublin in 1957, were not delivered until 1948. From Great Northern to Great Southern, or rather to CIE, for Chorus Imperarum had taken over the GSR two years before these scenes were recorded in 1947. At Thurles, on the main line from Dublin to Cork, D10 class 440, number 307, pilots B1 class 460, number 500. The large white dot on the train engine's tender shows that it had been converted to oil burning. Among the locos on shed are J15A, number 703, and one of the Monsell-designed Woolwich-built moguls, number 374. Another of over 60 locomotives converted to burn oil in 1947 alone. An unidentified J15, one of Ireland's most numerous class of steam locomotives, whose first members were built in the 1860s, potters around the yard in the station. Venerable carriages bearing the new livery and logo of CIE are also to be seen. An elderly Aspinall designed 440 dating from the 1880s is acting as station pilot at Cork's Glanmire Road station. C.J. Barnard had come here to see and to film the most impressive locomotives ever built for service on Ireland's 5 foot 3 standard gauge tracks, the 800 class. Number 801 Maka is being prepared at the shed adjacent to the station for a trip to Dublin. The 3460s Maeve, Maka and Tolcha, built in 1939 and 1940, were as large and as powerful as the Royal Scots of the LMS or the Kings of the Great Western. Indeed, it is possible that they were the largest 440s ever to run in Europe. They were introduced just as Europe was plunging into the Second World War. Britain had little coal to spare for the neutral Irish Free State, but train services were drastically reduced as a consequence. The 800s never really got a chance to show what they could do, for the coal shortages which continued after the war, as evidenced by the oil-burning locomotives seen already on this programme, were followed by rapid programme of dieselisation which came about in the mid-1950s. The cleaners have done a good job in preparing this leviathan of the Irish railways for the journey before it. Not a diesel to be seen in this atmospheric view of Glanmire Road Shed. From the ends of the platforms at Cork's Glanmire Road station, 
the tracks plunged into a tunnel 1,395 yards long on a ruling gradient of 1 in 60. This was a most severe challenge for trains leaving the city and bound for Dublin. Double or even triple heading was not unheard of, but this wasn't necessary with the 800s. Number 801 Maka slogs up to Kilbarry with her long Dublin-bound train, no two vehicles of which seemed to be the same. By way of contrast with the Dublin-bound train, a 440 drifts down the hill towards Cork with steam despair. This is a first glimpse of Cork's other station, the terminus of the former Cork Bandon and South Coast Railway at Albert Quay, whose trains served a network of lines in West Cork and where engines were stored out in the open. We will return to these lines later in the programme. Back at Glanmai Road, a Sunday excursion train to Cove prepares to leave one of the bays at the south end of the station. The locomotive is number 146, one of the J15 class. The train pauses at Cove Junction, where the line to Yall diverges, and crosses one of the inlets of the sea to reach the island in Cork Harbour on which Cove is situated. The train calls at Rushbrook, the final station before the terminus of the busy double track branch, which is still open today, is reached. The importance of Cove, or Queenstown as it was formerly known, was as a port of call for liners on the transatlantic run. Tenders from the port would run out to the liners moored in the great natural anchorage of Cork Harbour to collect and deliver passengers and mails. This was the last port of call for the ill-fated Titanic before she sailed towards her rendezvous with history on her maiden voyage in 1912. A J-15 steams out of Cove with a train bound for Cork, mostly composed of six-wheel stock. The Grit Citadel of Grit Southern and Western, Grit Southern and Latterly CIE steam was Inchicore Works in Dublin. This was the largest railway works in Ireland, where between 1852 and 1957, over 400 steam locomotives were built. Like all the great railway workshops, it was virtually self-contained and had all the facilities needed both to build and maintain the locomotives and rolling stock of the railway. These scenes were filmed at Inchicore in July 1950, when the works and the railway were still an almost exclusive preserve of steam. In the main repair shop, a wide variety of CIE steam locomotives are receiving attention. Outside one of the 440 tanks built for the opening of the Cavan and Leitrim Nora gauge line in the 1880s has been brought to the works on a well wagon for overhaul. A remarkable survivor from the dawn of the railway age in Ireland is seen in one of the many sightings of the works, a Bury 222 number 36 dating from 1847. Carriages were both built and maintained at Inchicore. To the left of the carriage being shunted with the overhead crane can be seen one of only three Pullmans ever to run in Ireland, supplied by the Pullman Car Company to the Great Southern in 1926. CIE's largest running shed was also situated at Inchicore. On the main line beside the works, one of the 500 class 460s drifts down towards Kingsbridge Station with an up express. Just out of the works is the third member of the 800 class, number 802 Tolcha, the last one built in 1940 and the first withdrawn in 1957. 
We move to North Dublin now, to Sutton and Baldoyle Station on the GNR's Hoth branch, to explore the famous Hill of Hoth tramway. This broad gauge electric tramway ran between Hoth and Sutton stations on the GNR branch off the Dublin to Belfast main line from Hoth Junction, about five miles north of Amiens Street, the GNR terminus in Dublin. Opened in 1901, by the time of its closure in 1959, it was the last electric tramway in Ireland. Both diesel rail cars and steam trains were used on the branch in the 1950s. This is Hoth Station, with a train headed by a GNR 060 preparing to depart for Dublin. As a GNR 442 tank backs onto a train at Hoth, tram number three prepares to depart from the station forecourt. The line was worked by ten open top tram cars built by Brish running on Brill bogies. Car number seven is at Stella Morris on the climb up to the summit from Sutton. Number seven is shortly followed by car number four. This is the view from the top of a tram car heading down the hill towards Sutton. The line was single track throughout with passing loops. From the perspective of the top deck of a tram car, the greater width of the Irish standard gauge can be fully appreciated. Approaching Sutton, the car sheds, the station and its associated sidings can be seen. Car number four arrives at Sutton. On sunny summer Sundays, the tramway was a popular diversion for Dubliners. As a fully laden car leaves Sutton for the summit, we must head back to the city. This is the view from the front of a Great Northern rail car, slowing for the stop at Rahini Station. And passing a steam hauled train at Eastwall Junction. For the next part of our programme, we head northwest from Dublin, pausing at Drummond on the main line from Dublin to Sligo for some scenes filmed by J.H. Roberts on the narrow gauge Cavan and Leitrim Railway, which ran north from here to Ballinamore, Arigna, and Bilturbet. As the Dublin to Sligo train leaves the up main line platform, the connecting service to Ballinamore waits in the adjacent narrow gauge station. The locomotive on duty is one of the former Cork, Black Rock and Passage Railway 242 tanks, which the Great Southern moved north to County Leitrim after it closed the Cork line in 1932. Cavan and Leitrim trains were mixed, conveying both passengers and goods vehicles. With stops for shunting along the way, travel was leisurely. A scheme to rebuild part of the line is now up and running at Drummond. This is the subject of our video programme entitled Cavan and Leitrim Revival. The train halts at Mohill for the engine to shunt and take on water. The water supply at Drummond was contaminated by minerals and was avoided at all costs. This is still a problem for the preservationists based at Drummond today. 
The station at Mohill has been secured as a possible future northern terminus of the new railway. Whilst the last of the 242s were scrapped when the line closed in 1959, Mohill station may once again echo to the sound of a steam locomotive in years to come. At Ballinamore, a train for the branch to Arigna waits in the bay platform at the station. In the shed yard can be seen number four, one of the former Tralee and Dingle railway engines, which ended its days on this line, and a Cavan and Leitrim 440 tank, similar to the one seen at Inchicore earlier in the programme. Another 242 tank will take us back to Drummond with the statutory delay for shunting and taking water at Mohill on the way. At Drummond, a set of rail cars form a Sligo to Dublin service. Based on the GNR rail cars introduced in 1948, the arrival of a fleet of these vehicles from 1952 onwards held at the beginning of the end for CIE steam. The rail cars were followed in 1955 by the Metropolitan Vickers A-class mainline diesels. At Kilfree Junction, the brand new diesel is contrasted with G2 class 240 number 655 dating from 1897, which was working the Balladrine branch. Moving on towards Sligo, the train passes Corrigna Gap Junction, where the Sligo, Leitrim and Northern Counties line from Inniskillen trailed in. At Sligo, a former Midland Great Western Railway 0 tank, classified by the Great Southern and CIE as a J26, is acting as the station pilot. CIE buses in their 1950s green livery occupy the station forecourt as the Sligo Leitrim and Northern Counties Railway Railcar B arrives in a service from Inniskillen. When Tim Shuttleworth visited Sligo in the summer of 1957, another former Midland Great Western loco was acting as station pilot that day. CIE 240 number 659 was built at the Midland Great Western Works at Broadstone in Dublin in 1893. Number 13 by that company, it was named Rapid. These were probably the last 240 tender engines to remain in service in Western Europe. A few lasting into the early 1960s, though sadly none of them escaped the cutter's torch. The late Victorian local was shunting a fascinating collection of stock ranging from Midland six-wheel postal van of roughly the same vintage as itself to modern CIE steel-bodied stock in the silver livery that matched that of the new mainline diesels. One of these, number A28, departs with a train for Dublin. Many of these machines, re-engined with General Motors power units, remained in service until the 1990s. The mainline departure is followed by the arrival of the Sligo Leitrim railcar. Built by Walkers of Wigan, this was the only broad gauge version of the narrow gauge railcars which this firm had built for many years for the County Donegal narrow gauge system, one of which we saw at the start of this programme. The SLNCR was the last independent standard gauge railway in the British Isles. Its headquarters were here at Manor Hamilton. One of the company's buses is in the station yard. Passenger services were normally entrusted to the rail car 
or rail buses. The line's heavy goods traffic was worked by a fleet of 064 tank engines, probably unique in that they were officially known by their names and were never given numbers. After passing through one of the line's numerous level crossings, the rail car crosses the Killy Hevelin viaduct and arrives at Inniskillen where the line made a junction with the GNR. Great Northern U Class 440 number 197 Loch Ney, built in 1915, passes through the station. And a Sligo Leitrim rail bus is glimpsed in the yard. Inniskillen was one of the hubs of the Great Northern's network of secondary main lines which closed in 1957. They ran from Dundalk in the east to Bundoran on the west coast and north to Oma. On the section between Inniskillen and Oma lay one of Ireland's most famous branches, that from Fintana Junction to the small village of Fintana in County Tyrone. Its fame lay in the motive power used to operate the line, for this was the home of the famous Fintana horse tram. When the line was built by the London Derry and Inniskillen Railway in the 1850s, lack of funds meant that construction was temporarily suspended when the line reached Fintana. When work resumed, it was decided to continue the line to Inniskillen from a point about three quarters of a mile from the village. Permission was obtained from the Board of Trade to work the short branch from what became Fintana Junction down to the village by horsepower, and it continued to be operated in this way until the line closed over a hundred years later. This is the sleepy village of Fintna in the 1950s. Goods traffic on the branch was worked by steam locomotives, but passengers were conveyed on the tram, which offered accommodation for all three classes. Third class ticket holders were confined to the top deck. The motive power over the years was a series of geldings that were usually named Dick. The gaps between the sleepers were filled in with ash so the horse would not stumble on them. The tram was painted in the GNR's blue and cream livery, which was also applied to its buses and diesel rail cars. The horse had an aversion to steam locomotives and was normally put in its shed at the junction before the connecting services arrived. A U-Class 440 brings a train bound for Oma into Fintna Junction. In the other direction, a train hauled by another U-Class 440, number 197 Loch Ney, heads for Inniskillen, where we saw this locomotive earlier in the programme. From the secondary lines in County Tyrone, it is back to the GNR main line as we steam through Drogheda and over the Boyne Viaduct on the way to see another remarkable stretch of railway, but this time one which closed in 1951. In the 1870s, the London and North Western Railway invested heavily in the Dundalk, Newry and Grenoble Railway, which was building lines from both Dundalk and Newry to a port which was being developed at Grenoble. The English company was anxious to increase its already substantial share of the cross-channel trade through the new route. The LNWR ended up providing virtually all of the finance for the port and the railway, which bore the indelible mark of its parent right up until the lines closed in 1951. This is Newry's Edward Street station in July 1947, with DNG 060 saddle tank number 1 McCrory, built at Crewe in 1873 at the platform. A GNR JT class 242 tank arrives with the train from Grenoble. The GNR had taken over the workings of the line from the LMS in 1933. On the section between Dundalk and Grenoble, a train approaches Belurgan station, hauled by JT class 242, number 93. In 1950, C.J. Barnard, who made these films, returned to the area to record the other part of the line between Newry and Grenoble, but this time he was equipped with colour film. 
On the other side of the river, which leads to Newry, is Norrawater Castle, and the GNR line to Warren Point, which featured in volumes two and four of this series. Warren Point is glimpsed across the water. Our train skirts the shore of Carlingford Loch before it pauses at O'Meath Station. Here we can clearly see that this is a London Northwestern train still running in Ireland some 27 years after the demise of the parent company. Not only is local number three Dundalk, a true product of crew works, right down to its London Northwestern style number plate, but the train of six wheelers is still painted in London Northwestern livery. The line from Newry to Grenoble followed the shore of Carlingford Lock for much of the way. This must have been one of the most picturesque railway journeys in Ireland. As the train approaches Carlingford Station, it is worth reflecting that the brief footage presented here is almost certainly the only authentic colour record of the carriage livery of the company which styled itself as England's premier line. As the train approaches Grenoble, under the protection of its LNWR signals, our coverage of this remarkable line regrettably comes to an end. We move to the other end of the country for the last part of our programme, which presents scenes from the railways of Cork and Kerry. This is Cork City in the mid-1950s. CIE buses are seen outside the Albert Quay terminus of the erstwhile Cork, Bandon and South Coast Railway. The lines serving West Cork were almost entirely operated by diesel traction by the mid-1950s. Most of the passenger services were in the hands of diesel rail cars, though some of this largely redundant carriage stock seen here at Albert Quay would be used occasionally on excursions and special workings, now hauled by diesel rather than steam locomotives. This is one of the Metropolitan Vickers C-Class diesels used on these lines, impersonating a steam locomotive, as they often did while working a short goods train. A typical three-coach rail car set is seen on a passenger working. At Clonakilty Junction, a C-Class is recorded in its original silver livery. They were soon repainted in green as the silver deteriorated very quickly in the Irish weather. Our destination in West Cork is a branch off the Clonakilty branch, which diverged at Balnascarthy. We are off to look at Ireland's only broad gauge roadside tramway, the Drimmer League and Court McSherry line. The first member of the C class, number C201, is shunting a Timber League beside its ruined friary. By this time, the line was used for seaside excursions during the summer and occasional goods workings. It was quite busy during the late autumn when it was used for the seasonal sugar beet traffic. The line terminated at the end of the pier, beyond the commendably well cared for platforms of the station at Court McSherry. Our final views of the West Cork lines are of rail cars entering Bandon on the main line. And of another set at the western end of the system at Bantry.
Back in Cork City, the 1847 Bury locomotive, which we saw in a derelict condition at Inchicore in 1950, has been restored and placed on display at Glanmire Road Station, where abandoned 460 tank is also seen shunting. The final part of this programme briefly explores two of the branch lines in the neighbouring county of Kerry, beginning with that from Hedford Junction on the Mallow to Tralee line to Kenmare. This branch remained largely steam operated up to its closure in 1959. J15 number 138, a locomotive frequently seen in pictures of the branch, makes up a mixed train at the junction. This was one of several lines built in Kerry with money supplied by the British government to improve communications in this remote but beautiful county. At Kenmare, number 138 comes off the train and goes to turn in readiness for the trip back to the junction. The spectacular nature of the area served by the line is seen as the train approaches Morley's Bridge, one of the intermediate stations on the branch. Another line opened by the Great Southern and Western, but paid for by the government, was that from Farn Ford to Valencia Harbour. A train crosses the graceful curving Glench Viaduct in this line. This was another spectacular Irish railway journey which can no longer be made as this branch closed in 1959. The line crossed an inlet of the sea on this long viaduct near Cahar before terminating at Valencia Harbour, the most westerly railway station in Europe. Passengers bound for Valencia Island would have to complete their journeys by boat. The end of the line at Valencia Harbour seems an appropriate place to end this particular journey. In a future programme in this series, we will follow on from these films made in the 1940s and 50s and look at the Irish railway scene in the 1960s.